but, but we get to talk about Cuba today. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. And this um, and this uh, relationship between U.S. and Cuba is something that I'm very interested in. I've been taking students to Cuba the last few years, and um, and I just lucked into meeting. I think the best explainer, the best person to talk about the relationship between U.S. and Cuba, and when I go to Cuba, the first person I want them to meet is um, Ernesto Dominguez Lopez. So, um, and Ernesto is, uh, is, is uh, on the faculty of the University of Havana. He's for the Center of Hem Hemispheric Studies in the U.S., and he is He's basically the expert. He he's had a, he chairs the committee that, that that reviews all of these relationships. He's on national television in Cuba, and he's here for the semester at the University of Wisconsin as a Tinker Fellow, which is an amazing program that brings the brightest scholars to the U.S. and sends our junior researchers abroad to try to build better international understanding. So I'm going to quit talking because Ernesto has a lot to share with you, which I think will help us all better understanding this complex and, op and huge opportunities with this relationship between the two countries. So thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, this is, in which is for me, the coldest state I've ever lived in my life. <laughs> probably not the same for you, most probably, but for me, definitely the coldest state ever. <laughs> which I'm looking forward to the next cold states that are going to happen in the next uh, few weeks. And my wife who is here is already suffering about it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I I'm came, uh, uh, my dear friend Steve invited me, and I couldn't say no, of course, uh, okay. for two things, because he's my friend first, but also because I always enjoy to engage in these conversations. And this happens to be a great place in which I, I've been this is my second time. I enjoy it. I've been here just for a few days each time, but I think we can have a productive conversation about a subject which I think it doesn't lack interest at all. And it's now in a moment in which this interest is probably even bigger, although sometimes it's difficult for people who live in the States to follow this uh, particular lesions in the midst of this barrage of new information every day that comes and it comes uh, like by the hour about the things that are going on. But part of this uh, very uh, dynamic, if I can use that word, sequence of events have to do with what is happening between you and the United States. And what I want to talk to you is, what I want to have a conversation with you is about what has happened between Cuba and the United States in the last couple of years but to do that, we have to look back in time. We have to look back in history. And we have to, at the very least, establish some uh, premises and some uh, starting points so we can start to begin to understand what is happening right now, but even more important, why it is happening. Which, to me, that's the big question, as you're going to see. So first of all, there is a few premises that I think are fundamental. The first one is that when we are talking about Cuba US, we are talking about the historical process. Not a given thing, not something that has just a 2, 10, or even 50 years. We are talking of more than 200 years of relation. Now that we can trace back at the very least to the American Independence War in which there were a Cuban there was a Cuban involvement by aiding the Continental Army by sending troops to Florida to fight the British. And those were early times, and probably there were earlier contacts, but the, at the least we can trace it back to that particular moment in time. So important for the US, the United States to be, um, for the continent and for the whole world. Also, it's important to understand that we are talking about Cuba US relations, we are talking about the multidimensional and extremely complex relation. It's not only political or economic relation or a cultural relation, it's all of it. And it's also connected to something which is the international system itself. 
is not only about Cuba US, it goes beyond Cuba US. And uh, the third idea, which I always try to emphasize, is that a major part of this relationship and one of the sources, of the major sources of the conflictive character it have had for a long part of, it, of this time is that it is also articulated around a central axis, which is the interaction between the Cuban National Project, which essentially has been the project of building a sovereign nation in Cuba, and the American National Project, which have to do with launching US as a global power and therefore creating the conditions in the region in first place to, create, to be able to project that power as far as possible, depending on the different times, depending on which the goals of this uh, power were at some of the different moments. And Cuba happened to be on the first line, one of the first targets in this process. Also, when we are looking at Cuba itself, and therefore to the conditions that have uh, essentially shaped the relationship, we have to, uh, I think that we can think on about this, I will say five permanent conditions. First one I already mentioned, which is the fact that the central axis for the Cuban history have been this national point of building a sovereign nation. Nation building is another is a concept that is very frequently used by the academia. But also the fact that the Cuban economy is an open economy. Open economy in the sense that it's an economy that depends essentially on its foreign relations, foreign trade, foreign investment, which is not a new thing. We are talking about, again, more than 200 years of this kind of, for, of open economy because due to the conditions in Cuba, we haven't been able to produce everything that we need to uh, survive, just to survive, much less to produce a, a, every piece of technology and anything that we can, that we may consume. So we depend on trade to do that, and also we require foreign investment and partnerships to develop the uh, different branches of our economy. So this is why our economy is very uh, susceptible to the political relations Cuba may establish, because of course international trade is also directly affected by international politics. Something that is also very well known to some extent is the fact that Cuba has migration as one of its most important permanent conditions. By the way, I'm saying migration because we had for centuries a lot of immigrants coming to Cuba until 1930, roughly. And we were talking earlier about the, the importance of the more than one million Spaniards who immigrated to Cuba between 1900 and 1930, which were very important for Cuba, but also for Spain, especially after the end of Franco's Gordon, how they preserved some of the Spanish traditions in Cuba. And probably all of us know about the presence of the so-called Cuban-American community here in the States, which is about roughly two million people that had a, that have a significant impact on U.S. economy, on U.S. politics, and also on Cuba, also Cuban uh, economy and politics. <clears throat> we also have a very intense relation with all major global powers in different times of history, from Spain back in the 15th, 16th, and 1700s, to the United States, to China, to Russia, to Soviet Union, to Britain, to France. All of this, among other things, connected to what, our economy, yes, but also to the fifth, and I will say the uh, totally impossible to change condition, which is the Cuban geographical location. We may want to move the country <laughs> away from where it is now, but we can't. And it is a location which is extremely important. When you look at the map, from a geopolitical point of view, from an economic point of view, Cuban location is of great importance when you look, when you see that it is at the center of this that is called the American Mediterranean, the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean Sea, near the Panama Canal, near the south of the United States. So an area in which international trade is very intense, in which, militarily speaking also, 
uh, any kind of naval power that could control Cuba could exercise a huge level of influence in the region, and so on and so on. So it is something that different powers consider when they approach Cuba in different moments. And if we look beyond that, different moments in time, this is from the colonial times, Cuba became the main hub of a very dense and intense network of colonial trade, Havana being the main hub for this colonial trade and the Spanish colonial trade, that was part of a broader global trade <laughs> network that eventually connected the whole world. And this is the 21st century, we are still located in the same place, <laughs> and trade happened to, to cross the same waters, for the most part, happened to go through the same straits and narrow places, and Cuba, you can barely see Cuba, <laughs> surrounded by this network of very important trade routes, which is what this red line represents, the most intense trade, uh, trade uh, routes for trade in the, in the world. So from every point of view, from any point of view, this location connected to the other aspects I mentioned made the Cuban history very connected to the wave of international history, of global history. <clears throat> As a result, I'm not going quickly on this, but I, but I think that it's worth to mention, that the result of the evolution of Cuba and the relation and the influence of the United States created a society in the country and created the economic structure <coughs> in the country that had these particular uh, features. First of all, Cuba evolved to become a single crop uh, economy based mainly on sugar that was sold in primarily in one market, the United States. And when I'm talking about single crop system, the 90% of the total revenue generated by the Cuban economy back in the time came from exporting sugar. And up to 90% of the Cuban sugar was sold in the United States. That's what single crop and single market actually meant. So it is clear that US was a dominant presence in Cuba even more so when, since late 1800s, especially in the first half of the 20th of the 20th century, American corporations control up to 60% of the Cuban Cuba industry. So everything that we we'll look at regarding trade between Cuba and the United States also need to include the fact that this trade benefit directly American corporations, at one of which, and the most important of which was of course United Fruit Company, which is very well known and not for the best reasons in Central America and the Caribbean. And our social structure was essentially this hierarchy of different sectors in which power was distributed up down with a high concentration of this power, social, economic, and political power in the upper echelons of this structure. So this structure social, economic, and political in which U.S. was a really dominant force, leading to the establishment of different governments and without a really stable political system that could be considered purely democratic. We had a constitutional democracy for about 10 to 15 years prior to the 1930s and about another eight years after the 19, during the 1940s, maybe 12 years, and that's it. There were a lot of political turmoil. There were a number of, diff of, of dictatorships. Uh, actually, we had a number of coup uh, <coughs> military coups, most of which were, actually all of them, except for one, were led by a person that became the most important political figure, again, not for the good reasons, in Cuba, Fulgencio Batista, who happened to be supported by US during most of his political career, <laughs> for the most of his, from most of his political career. So when we are talking about this permanent entanglement and this relationship between Cuba and the United States, we have to consider this cultural, economic, and social presence, the structure of Cuba, and the role played by U.S. in Cuba politics, which eventually shaped also U.S. and Cuba foreign policy, and therefore developed a relation between the two countries. And of course, it is also important the fact that we as a country, as a nation, we are a very complex mix of peoples and groups from all different origins. But with one particular character, which is 
we are, as an identity thing, we are first Cuban and then anything else, which is different from what you, what you can see in other places, even here in the United States. So this is the Cuba that under these conditions had a revolution that attempted and intended to change all of this structure, trying to, first of all, create the conditions to build this sovereign nation, especially for one reason. In Cuba, sovereignty and social change became so intertwined because of the relationship between the Cuban oligarchy and the Cuban upper classes and the United States as a dominant power, which were allies in this uh, very <coughs> complex power structure, you, can, you couldn't have one without the other at the time. So the Cuban revolution that came in 1959 attempted to change all of that and actually succeeded in changing the country deeply. And that had a number of consequences. Just to mention one of them, that led to the immigration of the Cuban elites, people who emigrated to, you know where? Florida. <laughs> Essentially Florida. Place in which many of them already had property, had some resources, and where they were received, this is 1959, 1960s, they were received as people fleeing from communism, using the Cold War perspective, and that meant that they were, they were supported by U.S. authorities, which gave them some financial aid and some facilities, some, uh, I will say, access to certain uh, financial, economic, and political support, along with the fact that Miami was becoming, at the time, one of the first global cities, especially oriented towards Latin America, which led them to become which allowed them to become a very important community in the economic point of, from the economic point of view. And you know that when you have economic power, your ability to have influence on the political system is really significant. Money is a major factor in politics, right? So when you have money, very often you have access to politicians. And that was what happened to the community, which also meant that in Cuba, we had to deal with a few other stuff like, for example, an increase in US hostility. What does this, why was this the case? Because of course, through the eyes, I mean from the eyes, from the perspective of the United States and through the lens of the Cold War, Cuba was simply a threat for the United States. It doesn't matter that there was a, a real reason for having a social revolution in Cuba that there were contests between the Cuban leadership and the United States, that there were attempts to preserve a normal, and I will come back to this concept later, normal relation. The fact that there was a process in which Cuba tried to build its own nation, separated from the influence of the United States, was understood in the midst of the Cold War as a threat for US national security, and that was it. And the answer was an increasing hostility going <laughs> going through the path of increasing sanctions and what we call in Cuba economic warfare that eventually led to what you call here the embargo, or we call in, the state, in Cuba the blockade. Which also combined with some other actions against Cuba, like sabotage, something that we will call today terrorism. You know, like bombing places, burning sugar, sugar uh, cane fields, and so on. And the reaction from the Cuban government, along with the change in the country, was, OK, Len, that if the if, if US is hostile to us, and they are putting pressure on other countries so they will cut the relationship with Cuba, and they will try to isolate Cuba, and they actually they uh, succeeded for a while in isolating Cuba, the <coughs> Cuban answer was to have an increasing international activism, but in relation with liberation movement, as we call it, in Latin America, in Asia, in Africa, in Africa, and also, uh, building a very complicated relationship with the Soviet Union and the Eastern Socialist Bloc, which meant, yes, these countries offer an alternative to the American market, but it led to a concentration of Cuban trade up to an 85% in Eastern Europe and Soviet Union. But what it was not, what it really was not, is, the, is that idea that Cuba was a proxy of the Soviet Union acting on behalf of the Soviet Union around the world, which is 
definitely not true. Even the most famous case of Cuban activism in the international system, which is the war in Angola in general in Africa, it was actually Cuba forcing the hand of the Soviet Union, despite what they thought, Cuba decided to support the new Angolan government against the uh, invasion coming from South Africa, the same South Africa with the apartheid regime, and Zaire, which was also an ally of the West at the time, a country in which Mobutu had, uh, uh, had overthrown the democratically elected government of Patrice Lumumba back in the 1960s. There is a long, a long history of the Cuban government in Africa that was essentially uh, done despite Soviet Union, which was essentially forced to support Cuba in the process. And that was also a contribution to the increasing conflict, the increasing hostility between Cuba and the United States, because of course it was a, 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 a kind of a feed, permanent feedback for the, for the conflict itself. Uh, a recursive process in which there was an action, a reaction, a reaction to the reaction, and so on. So I won't say that the radicalism of the Cuban Revolution was a result of U.S. hostility, but certainly played a role in the pace and the ways in which this radicalism came to be. This had a major change between 1918 and 1991. And I'm jumping ahead because we want to focus on the recent events. But this is essentially uh, a major turning point in Cuban history, actually in world history. The collapse of socialism, by the way, we call it socialism, not communism. There is a difference in the concepts and the definitions that we may discuss if you want. But it is a permanent misunderstanding when we talk about this uh, here in the, in the US, they talk about communist countries. We never called ourselves or people in Eastern Europe, we never called them communists. Not even themselves called themselves communists. <laughs> and that started what is calling Cuba the special period, which can be translated into the deepest and the worst crisis we've ever had in peace times. How did this crisis was? Maybe looking at this chart, you can't have an idea. This here, this here, represents a 35% contraction of the Cuban economy between 1989, which was not the best year in the 1980s, and 1993. When I'm talking about crisis, uh, and talking about the moment in which I was attending a boarding school, I was in high school, in, uh, since 1991, between 1991 and 1994, and there were a couple of days in which we will have only cabbage to it. Literally, only cabbage. There was no public transportation, almost no electricity. The country was really, really a huge, huge crisis that included also social crisis. That's why in 1994 there was this rafters who came to the States in mass that have to do with this very difficult situation and the lack of alternative at the, at the point, at the time. And that also launched or trigger a series of reforms in which Cuba, its <coughs> government, and society tried to cope with this crisis by changing these structures and changing things that needed to be changed in the process, and of course, in a permanent process of try, try and error. Interesting enough, the US government's answer or reaction to this crisis was passing this piece of legislation and implementing these policies. The rationality behind this is very simple. Cuba was the last remain of the Cold War. So, by a reverse domino theory, <laughs> Cuba should, at the time, uh, will, they will say Cuba will be the next one. It's not possible that Cuba survived this. And as Cuba didn't collapse in the first year, and as within the United States, there was these groups like the Cuban American elite in Miami forcing their, uh, their agenda into US foreign policy, using the political system here in the United States, these laws were passed as a, a subsequent attempt to strengthen the sanctions against Cuba. And even more interesting, 
to take a, a very significant part of US foreign policy out of the hands of the President of the United States, which is, according to the Constitution, the official in charge of US foreign policy, right? It is in the Constitution. However, these laws took this particular aspect of US foreign policy out of the hands of the President and put it in the hands of the Congress. That's why, to effectively end what you call the, the embargo, it has to be the Congress. <clears throat> During uh, George Bush uh, 43 administration, it, this also included a few other restrictions, like, for example, the ban uh, of the use of dollars for Cuba, which is why in Cuba there is a 10% penalty on US dollars. So if you, you go to Cuba, I will suggest you to change the dollar for something else like euros or, or Canadian dollars. Because that's a way that you have found to compensate for how much money was losing any international transaction because it had to change dollars for anything else. Otherwise, it could be punished, and any company dealing or using dollars in transaction with Cuba could be punished. This is what these laws and all these programs meant that the authority of uh, US institutions will go beyond its borders in what is a very clear case of extraterritoriality in the enforcing of the law, punishing foreign companies, third, base, third country based companies if they engage in some relationship with Cuba. Also with Iran, also with North Korea, but in this case, Cuba. And of course, there was a significant level of support for dissidents and the internal opposition in Cuba, which essentially messed with Cuban domestic politics. And it was in, the, in, in that uh, kind of relationship, this uh, stage of the relationship, which uh, President Barack Obama stepped in. And after a few years in which he said, OK, I want to change things, but he did little other than changing the speech and trying to bypass Miami very often. In December the 17th, 2014, he announced, well, he and Raul Castro at the same time announced to the world that things will be changing. Uh, short, uh, brief anecdote, uh, that date, that particular date, I was in a conference in Havana that takes place every year of Cuban and American specialists uh, discussing Cuban relations. <laughs> it was the last day of the conference. November, uh, December the 17th, which happened to be San Lazaro, by the way, for all, uh, for those of you that are, know something about Santeria, this is San Lazaro State, one of the uh, most important religious celebrations in Cuba, and it's very popular. And uh, the first couple of days of the conference, consensus was, well, President Obama could do many things, but he won't, he won't do it, because, of course, you know, this is politically costly, and he won't be able to do it. That day, early that day, we had the news, oh, the, the both of them will speak at the same time. OK. <laughs> That's big. But we, th we thought, OK, this will be probably about the Cuban prisoners still in the States, and probably this will, there will be a, a, a change of prisoners for Alan Gross in Cuba. He was uh, in jail in Cuba for, uh, let's say, breaking the Cuban law. Let's leave it there. It's a longer and more complicated case. So that's what we thought that happened. And when we, OK, uh, at noon, we sat down, watched TV, watched the TV, uh, Raul Castro first. By the way, we also heard Obama, which you didn't hear Raul, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> the first thing that Raul said was, uh, we had agreed that we're going to change the prisoners and whatever. Oh, that, that was a big celebration. Second, we have agreed that we're going to restore diplomatic relations. Are we going to start the process of negotiation in, uh, in the way of, normalization, of uh, uh, trying to normalize the relationship between the two countries? Uh, long story short, there was a workshop in the afternoon that was supposed to happen that never happened. <laughs> we went back to a drawing board, to a drawing board trying to figure out what happened. We had lunch, okay. <laughs> of course. And then we went back, because otherwise. And what I'm trying to say here, that this took everybody by surprise. Only people that were actively involved in the secret negotiations that led to this point knew what was happening. Because I'm talking about 150 to 200 especially from, the, from both countries. Most people that is actually actively studying this uh, subject 
even, even some politicians were there. Nobody knew anything about it. So it was kept secret in a very effective way. So the question is, why did Obama change this policy? There's a bunch of reasons. The international system, which is now nothing like the one that was in the 90s. Now you have a way more multipolar international system. When you consider China, when you consider <coughs> Russia, and when you consider other actors like Iran, like or not, regionally speaking, it's a power that should be taken into consideration in any calculation you are trying to do. Also, Latin America itself had changed. The pink tide, and yes, it was started to recede, but still, the Cuban from Latin America was very different. It's not like in the 1960s, it is not a, it was on a time of isolation. Actually, Cuba has become an irritant in the relationship between the United States and Latin America. Why? Because even right-wing governments have had a good relation for, for, with Cuba for the last 20, 30 years at the minimum. The best example probably is Colombia. Hmm. And you know that the peace talks between the Colombian government and the guerrillas happened in Havana. That's not for nothing. That is showing how active Cuba is in Latin America. And there was a summit of the Americas in April 2015. And so Latin America's government has said, if Cuba is not invited, we will not attend to the summit. That kind of established a deadline, because that would have been a setback for US diplomacy, very clearly. So something had to be done. But also we have to include the changes in Cuba. Changes being the economic reform that had opened room for private initiative for our businesses, which it's a big part of US speech, political speech regarding Cuba, which is we want to support the private sector in Cuba. That wouldn't have made any sense in the 1980s. There was no private sector involved. Very teeny, tiny, small, and and just in a few areas, private sector, like uh, small private farms. That was essentially it. Now, and last year's statistic, we had up to 30%, almost 30% of the labor force in Cuba employed in the private sector, or the non-state sector. It's a better way to define it, because that includes also co-ops, which are not considered private in Cuba. Not all of them, at the least. And uh, that's a very important change. Also, some political changes that we're going to mention a little bit later. But even more important, we have to look into US politics. Some groups with relative power that started to show some interest, agribusiness, the uh, a Chamber of Commerce, and if these are none of them is a liberal progressive group. These are essentially conservative groups, but they have this interest. And some other liberal groups are connected to interests like uh, biopharmaceutical industry for example, uh, technology that wanted to provide services in Cuba, and it's a market that was almost virgin, and so on. But essentially, the fact that US was excluded from Cuba, in which all the companies from other countries, despite all the sanctions, are and were operating and had been operating since at the very least the 1990s. The, big, the, the, the most important cases or examples are Melia Hotels, Charity International from Canada, uh, most probably, which I will say that are the best example of this foreign investment going on in Cuba. The U.S. was excluded from this by its own laws and its own policies. And of course, you have to look at the Cuban American community, how it has changed. The wave of new immigrants and the new generations have created a condition in which more than half of Cuban Americans do not support the embargo slash blockade all these policies. And of course, all of these have to be put in the context of electoral politics. Obama was a guy who demonstrated that it was possible to win Florida without actively acting against the Cuban government. Even winning the Cuban vote in Florida. What changed? A few ideas. We can synthesize this in this. The essence of the changes was to eliminate some restrictions that were limiting the access of American companies to Cuba. For the most part, that was the general goal. And that included also 
reducing restriction for travel to Cuba, uh, opening room for other kind of relationship between the two countries, and so on. Deep there, there was the idea that this was a way also to help the Cuban people, but it was clearly help them help the Cuban people to change its political system. And this is not something that I'm taking out of this. President Obama said, literally, that the aims of the American policy towards Cuba were the same. This is in the speech of December 17th, 2014. Just that they were changing the means because the prior policy hadn't worked. Mm -hmm. That was essentially it's something that was restated by Roberta Jacobson, the leader of the American delegation to the negotiation back in Havana in 2015. So it's very clear, also John Kerry, in a way, referred to that when he spoke at the reopening of the American Embassy in Havana in the summer of 2015, a day in which, by the way, I spent the whole day sitting in a TV studio for a TV studio for six hours, out of which I could stand for only 20 minutes because it was kind of a mess there. And they were, I, I, were invited, I was invited as an expert to talk about that and answer questions, and it was kind of a crazy thing. But <laughs> it was a very interesting day. I kind of proud of, of not being part of it, although I will not do that again. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I don't have to go there and explain why the embassy was closed. I hope, for, I hope that that won't happen. <clears throat> but it also ended, this is as late as January this year, these last two that were programs and policies in place to stimulate some forms of illegal immigration from Cuba to the United States. Uh, wet food dry food policy is a policy that has nothing to do with that. Uh, uh, the wet food dry food policy means that a person coming to the States that make it to U.S. soil will be accepted as a refugee here. And by the way, make it to the, make it to the, the, the American soil meant with the water below the knee. Hmm. Literally. Mm -hmm. If you were intercepted in the sea, you will be returned to Cuba. That's a difference. That's why people, uh, that's what the immigration shift from the, from the sea to Mexico on the, south, on the southern route to the United States. The difference is that these Cubans, they come to the border and we say, I'm Cuban, I'm here, I'm a refugee. Whereas Mexicans and Central Americans, they have to hide and try, and try to escape from the border patrol. So it's a little bit different, it was a little bit different. This was ended generally the 12th this year. And the other one was a specific program targeting Cuban medical professionals serving abroad that was terminated during the 17th this year. That was the very last two actions by Obama regarding Cuba. What never changed? What didn't change? This, the same that we already saw, which means that the blockade slash embargo is still there. So these different things opens a new, and in my opinion, deeper question. What does normal mean? First of all, if there is a set of sanctions, it cannot be a normal relationship under any parameters, OK? But the other question is, what does Cuba understand as normal? The way in which we on the Cuban have presented is that we are two nations, sovereign nations. So we are equal under the international law. So we should discuss our differences as equals. I'm not quite sure that that's US approach to normal. When it includes the idea that Cuba should make some political changes, domestic political changes to meet its standards. And when we look at history, we see that very often, normal has been U.S. is a big power, Cuba is a little country, and therefore Cuba should uh, follow U.S. lead. I'm not saying that that's the interpretation that U.S. is using. I'm just saying that it's a likely an interpretation that is in the minds of many people about what normal means, and that means that this deep, very important question is yet to be answered by everybody involved in this normalization, whatever that may mean. <clears throat> so when the midst of this process, this day came. 
funny story. I have a few funny stories uh, connected to this. <laughs> November the 8th, I was in New York. November the 9th, I was going to Columbia University for a panel about Cuban relations. And this, the uh, topic of the panel was the American elections and its impact on Cuban relations. Uh, there were two of us, William Leo Grande, which is a very important scholar here in the States, uh, specialized in Cuba and Cuban relations. And me, I was there. I was just there. And uh, William Leo Grande, he was coming from Washington, D.C., from American University, and he had to rewrite his whole paper because he has written a paper based on the idea that Hillary Clinton will be the next president. Therefore, the, ba the, the basic idea was that there will be a continuity in the policy because, of course, it was something, a structure for the Democratic Party. Uh, Hillary Clinton was part of the establishment as, as Obama, and therefore they had more or less the same goals, yada, yada, yada. Okay, he had to drop all that, and we, uh, we had, he had to start again, and so we had to figure out how to explain this. That's why the first question is, what would happen next? And we just could came out with four basic scenarios. What could happen? Uh, we spent some time in the second one, and then, only then, we went to further changes when this was released on June the 16th this year. It seems that it was about a century ago, but it was just six months ago, less than six months ago, right? And look at the title. That's the actual title of the document that was presented to the public and signed in the Manuela Time Theater in Miami, of all places, Miami. So if Obama had tried to take Cuba the Cuba policy outside, out of Miami, Trump essentially put it back in Miami. And that's telling a lot. This is what it intended. If you look at this, this memorandum, despite all the rhetoric, the rhetoric around, around, it, around it, what it intended was to reinforce the enforcement of these existing sanctions Going more, going more to the letter of the sanctions, and going back to the a little bit to the you know, spirit of the sanctions. But interesting enough, it explicitly, explicitly allowed the already existing business venture to keep going, to keep operating, even when they were outside or were part of the areas that were included in the sanctions. Because this is important. All of this have to be all understood also through the lenses of the business interest here in the States. Which groups are interested and which groups are actively trying to operate in Cuba. No American, no US airline, not to compete with American airlines, uh, which is one of the, the, the ones that is operating in Cuba, actually it's the, the one that being operated for a longer time, for the longest time. Uh, no American, uh, no U.S. airline have, was, was forced to leave the Cuban market directly, politically speaking. Uh, no company already operating in Cuba was forced to leave Cuba. And that was very clearly part of this policy, not to mess with companies if possible. But in September, October, late September, early October, this happened. The 60% of the American personnel in Havana was withdrawn, and up to 15, it's about two thirds of the Cuban personnel in Washington was expelled. And the DFS uh, established a war, a travel warning for Cuba, which has created a lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear among people that is willing to try to give what will happen, how this will be, and so on. And the justification was this one. The problem with this is that as far as we know, there is no any evidence that has been made public that these attacks even happen. Much less that the Cuban government was either actively or possibly involved in any kind of attack against US. And if we try to think about it, it will make no sense at all that the Cuban government attack American diplomats, something that we have never, uh, the Cuban government have never done, has never done despite all the hostility along the years. 
it's just harmful for Cuba, this kind of incidents that in <clears throat> October, September, changing the speech from incidents to attacks without providing any additional evidence. So, this targeted, in our opinion, specifically this industry. Why? Because it harms or it tried to reduce the number of Americans visiting Cuba that have reached the number of 300,000 by the end of 2016. This is without the Cuban Americans. All other Americans, which had come third <coughs> by countries in the uh, ranking of most visitors sent to Cuba. Canada, Cubans living abroad, and and US. If you add Cuban Americans, it goes second. So it is targeted this. Just after we had Irma, which affected specifically, or almost specifically, the most important touristic destinations in Cuba. Just after that, this came. And interesting enough, <coughs> this particular this particular decision will harm directly a sector is supposed to be supported by the United States. I'm not talking about that, but I'm going to give you this idea. Most <laughs> Americans who visit Cuba, they stay in particular places, in private places, not in state-owned hotels. So the first victims of this will be, or are already, these private business or new business persons who had U.S. customers as the main customer base, that in the case of Alaska, would use. And in November, this list was released, a confidence of, of what was announced in June. This said 200 entities. It's just a selection of the most important ones that are restricted. I, I was joking. This is actually part of the list. There is a couple of brands that cannot be consumed by Americans as, as like, soda uh, brands, which is crazy. Uh, and there is some others that are not included, so you can have uh, to call up another tropic college you're in Cuba. Oh. Good, luck. Good luck with that. But the most interesting part here is that the last line with Son Esperanza de Desarrollo Mariel is the area that is designated specifically for foreign investment. U.S. is essentially excluding itself from this project, which is foreign investment under very favorable circumstances, very favorable conditions for the foreign investors. As part of the development project, of course, it's, a, it's a, an area that is meant especially for high tech and development, and investment that contributes to the development, not only to the economic growth, but to development in Cuba. But this is in Havana. The partner of Cheradon is Gaviota, which if you remember was in the previous list, but this was not so sure. Also interesting. So this already had and will have a very significant impact. The, uh, we can go into this, but the most important thing is this will harm the Cuban economy. And the most important part <coughs> is that it's reducing, first of all, it's reinforcing restrictions for American citizens and companies and is also reinforcing restrictions for Cubans traveling to the States because, of course, the embassies are the big issue now. There is no additional prohibition, but you don't have the person there to process your visa application. In Havana, it's simply not possible. Cubans willing to travel to the States, they will have to travel to a third country, which means that probably they will have to apply for a visa in that third country and then wait for their uh, process to the application to be processed and Right now, last year, Cuba was led the world ranking in uh, denials in visa applications for, by the United States. 84% of all applications were denied. So they will have to go to a third country with an 84% probability of being denied. Just consider that. And if you want to immigrate to the United States, which is something that is included in a treaty between the two countries since 1995, or to 20,000 immigrant visas, they have to go to Colombia, specifically, and only to Colombia, a country for which Cubans need a visa. 
and they will have and the, the recommend, oh you have to be ready to stay there for two weeks <laughs> which means money apply for a visa to Colombia because Colombia doesn't care if you are uh, you have a, an interview at the embassy at American Embassy or not that is not the problem and you see this is essentially restricting that and creating problem because this means also family reunification is part of that for example go to the political, to the economic, and to the hu human part of the problem. So, why this was the case? When we look at what we consider for Obama, the main variables are essentially the same. There was still the same complicated place. The different groups within the United States are essentially the same. And for the Cuban side, the economy, which is the biggest track of these decisions, remains in the same weak position and therefore engaging with the United States process was a way to remove its biggest threat, which happens to be an external threat. So why then? We also have to consider this. US foreign policy have been really erratic for the last <laughs> almost a year. Deals, no deals, going here, going there, speeches, non-speeches, uh, fat little broken man, all of that. <laughs> tweets. Hmm? Tweets. tweets after tweets, tweets after yeah. tweet, tweets. and the Rex Tillerson, all of that, that you know. So going deeper, I think it's very clear that the internal political alliances are becoming unstable here in the States. If you see the dynamics of the administration, and in Congress, and how people come and go, and how different people in Congress take a side of the other. The alliances, the political alliances, are not stable at all. You cannot uh, draw a line in which you say everybody in this, this group will be always here, everybody in this group will be always there. There is a very clear poli uh, party divide right now in Congress. But even within, in, within that Congress, that it is not clear that, for example, all Republicans support Trump. Or the way in which they support it is complicated. At some point, he even met the Democrats in Congress trying to put some pressure on the Republicans, for example, when he met Nancy Pelosi and all that. And if we look at the timing of these different announcements, and we connect that to the ability of these different groups to bargain in these conditions, the timing is very near or around very important legislation that were this, that were under process in the in Congress, uh, like the American Healthcare Act or the uh, tax reform, and also you have to consider the uh, Russia case and how they have been treated. And remember that people like, for example, Marco Rubio, he sits in the committees that deals with foreign policy, but also with Russia. So the ability of these individuals and groups to exercise some level of leverage for gaining in favor of their agendas, and people who does have an agenda, people who do have an agenda, is very important right now. Also, there is an interest in showing that the president is delivering results from its electoral base, right? Showing that. And this includes the fact that there have been the gross overstatement of the role of the Cuban Americans and the fact that uh, Donald Trump won Florida. Mm -hmm. this, this is just a, a link that I'm leaving you there, if you want to look at it, that showed, showed that it is not true. It was not South, South Florida. It was actually North Florida that made the difference, the panhandle. Because even in those south, uh, southern counties, Hillary Clinton overperformed Obama, who won Florida. And it's, uh, there is evidence that the Cuban vote was split, split again between the two. But of course, to these particular Cuban American politicians saying that the Cuban vote gave Florida to Trump because he had a stronger uh, a policy proposal for Cuba, they want to uh, go back to a more uh, hostile policy. 
because they didn't like what Obama had done, that kind of reinforces their position. So this is essentially domestic politics what I'm talking about here. So are those the only ones? I don't think so. We can also look at this. You know, remember that Trump said that he wants, OK, but he wants a better deal. And then, then later he said that, oh, Cuba, the US have been giving everything, and Cuba have been giving nothing. There is a very important caveat here, which is what US is giving to Cuba is reducing some restrictions and sanctions. Cuba doesn't have any sanction against the United States. But what US uh, elites and this kid guys in Cuban, uh, Cuban Americans in Miami are asking for are domestic changes, like in political changes. Regime change, to put it in just one expression. That's not <coughs> the same kind of thing. And it conflicts with sovereignty. And we also have to think about the fact that we're going to have elections in Cuba next year. And for the first time in over 50 years, there will be no Fidel or Raul Castro as the main leader of the main office in government. Which, by the way, a government that has, by constitution, this character, which we can express through this the idea, this theory and design, the idea that all powers come from the people through the National Assembly and then they go to the other branch of government, where, which are not separated powers, and the fact that there is no president of the republic in Cuba, despite that people called Raul and called Fidel president, is even in the constitution, but it's not the president of the republic, so there is no separated election. It is a parliamentary election because it is essentially a parliamentary system. But that's something that very often is not understood about Cuba. And we do have elections, by the way. <laughs> So people say, oh, do you don't have, oh, we do have elections. We just don't have elections for a president that doesn't exist. <laughs> so coming back to the projected scenarios, it's very clear that we are now in the first of them. But I still think that all of them are possible. But I also think that right now, this is essentially the order of likelihood. But the first three are very near one from the other. The last one is a little bit less, actually a lot less likely than the others. But the biggest, the most important word here is actually uncertainty. That's pretty much where we are. And that's what I have for you today. Time for a few questions, yeah. Uh, question about the private sector in Cuba. Yep. I think it's absolutely stupid of this administration to abolish person to person travel, which provided the U.S. tourists that you mm -hmm. mentioned mm -hmm. that support the private sector. Uh, and the private sector are entrepreneurs. It would, was my view, a traditional source of power for the Republican Party in the United States, mm -hmm. totally abolished. I was surprised when Raul Castro at the last Congress of the Communist Party talked about the resistance in the state sector to change mm -hmm. and the need for Cuba to have a private sector that are doing great things. Mm -hmm. And then more recently, uh, they've clamped down on giving new licenses. Mm -hmm. My interpretation is they fear the emergence of a competing uh, power within Cuba. Could you comment? Yeah, uh, I will comment in a few directions. First of all, uh, the thing is that this private sector is uh, understood in Cuba as a complement, as something that that helps the main part of the economy, which is the major state-owned enterprises, which control and manage the fundamental parts of the economy, to have a more like a more dynamic economy, to generate jobs, to generate income and revenue, and therefore to expand the uh, consumption capacity of the population and so which is essentially something that works at that level. It was also meant to overcome some of the limits that the fully state ownership of 
especially services, service industries, uh, that were not very efficient in many ways. Also now we are opening, and her PhD research actually is about that, she's, I was especially, mm -hmm. that's why I'm promoting her. Uh, if I don't mention her, I would be in trouble later. And, uh, <laughs> and now, the, and actually this in the last documents, that, in the, in the documents that were published after the last uh, Congress of the party, uh, there is uh, this project of creating forms of association between state-owned companies, uh, private sector, foreign investors, cooperative, and we countries working on all of this. I will say that the biggest problem here uh, the bigger thing is that it is essentially a try and error process. I mentioned this earlier. So we try that the country tries something and then is evaluated and then is adjusted or dropped altogether or kept or increased depending on. And one of the things with this licenses, the stop in the in uh, English licenses it had to do or have, have to do with the fact that there are two things. First of all, there are many activities that could be uh, gather into one broad category, like for example, if you have a little hostile, you, you should be able to offer uh, food services, for example. I mean, like a little restaurant in your uh, facility, and you should not need a different license, which now is the case. Also, there is a problem with the tax system and trying to reorganize so it will be more efficient in collecting taxes at the same time, adjusting this, because of course there is tax evasion in Cuba. This is something new, so we have, you have to adjust the different uh, the different structures to cope with the requirements of the situation. That's one part of the very important part of the story. The other part of the story, which I think is important to keep in mind, is that these reforms are not meant to create a class of very wealthy citizens in Cuba that are way above everybody else. The idea of the project is to keep uh, levels of equality because uh, the project itself was based on the idea of providing equality and social justice. And this is generating inequality. You have people doing better, there is people that is doing worse, relatively speaking. Almost by definition, that's the case. So the idea is that the country and the government is looking for ways to control this inequality, to keep it in limits that are manageable by the country. So all of these decisions and back and forth in this different aspects have to be understood through these different points of view. And of course, trying ways in which it will be efficient, economically speaking also. So this last decision, I think, is based for the most part in the first and the second things I mentioned. The reorganization of the license and the, this control on the tax evasion and also trying to rethink how this will operate uh, in the context of inequality and the fight against inequality, which is something that now is not not remotely as big as the uh, levels of inequality you can find in Latin America or even the United States. But when compared to ourselves, Cuba in the 1980s, in the 1980s, yes, it is significantly higher, and it's a very important domestic problem. So that that is my take on that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Good to see you again. Great to see you. Remember you, you mm -hmm. uh, took care of my students two years ago mm -hmm. when we came down to the conference. Just an observation that I appreciate your, your comment on, and that's sort of who has taken over. What did it mean that Trump, a Republican, won the presidency? And then what is the result of that within the foreign policy making bureaucracy in the United States? And I think it did matter. It mattered that he was a Republican, even mm -hmm. if he was a maverick Republican. He's ultimately Republican. Mm -hmm. And that brought back in the debate that's often been partisan, not always partisan, mm -hmm. of how to defeat the Cuban Revolution. As you point out, Obama's people were still in the same mm -hmm. uh, approach, they just the same goal. But they had a different approach. But the people who don't agree with that approach and who don't believe the world has changed. Remember, there's also a foreign part of the U.S. foreign policy establishment that does not believe the world has changed, does not believe Iran should be accommodated, doesn't believe any other country should be accommodated, Russia shouldn't be accommodated, China shouldn't be accommodated. The United States should still be able to dominate the world. It's those kind of, in my view, you see, it's those kind of voices 
which isn't really all that much about Marco Rubio and a few people in Florida. It's a broader thing mm -hmm. of those kind of voices gaining the upper hand in Washington. But it's then countervailed by the fact that a fundamental change did happen on, in 2014. And American businesses and others were started to be drawn in. There were negotiations and agreements that everyone agrees are in the interests of both countries. And so that's why it's only a partial reversal. Mm -hmm. But it's still an important reversal oh, yes, because the sure. people now steering the ship have not just a different view toward Cuba, they have a different view of America's role in the world. They don't buy Joseph Nye. Yes. They consider yes. him to be a you know a, an incredible heretic and a disaster. They you know the, it, it's mm -hmm. it's the view of the world of John Bolton. Yes. So mm -hmm. that to me that's the, the and that's why I don't like to focus so much on on Rubio and the Florida people. Yes, Trump decided to to go mm -hmm. there and also win some political points, but it, it's a little more that yeah. other view of how to. Uh, attack Cuba that has now again more come to the fore. Absolutely, I mentioned Mark Rubio as a as a as a case in point in which it's very clear how this influence come to be, but it's obviously a change in the in the in general in the style, in the political establishment in the states that is under attack. But it's actually it's not that under attack as in the process of change in which the most radically conservative and hawkish people is taking power positions uh, within government. Um, the fact of the matter is that it's not clear that there is a clear strategy in foreign policy. That's the difference between now and let's say, for example, 2001, 2002, 2003 with Bush 43, in which, in which you could see that there was, you could like it or not, but there was a kind of a clear strategy about how to do foreign policy. Right now, that's not that clear, but still, the general trend is to a more aggressive position, less compromising. And there is people that is buying in this uh, point of view. One of the things that I think is that this administration, uh, the president itself, some people from the president, is more interested in uh, deregulation and tax cuts than it is in foreign policy itself. So it's probably an area in which he can pay back favors very often. And that will be an interesting dynamics there, uh, to which extent this uh, the recent, for example, success in passing the tax reform, at least to the, the, the point which is now, will be reflected in changes in foreign policy. For example, I don't know. We have to look at it. But definitely, I, I agree that there is a very important change in this process. And these people is not interested at all in, uh, I would say, a global perspective based on smart power or whatever. They are more of the line of we are the big guys and we do whatever we want. Although there is also this position that, yeah, well, we may, we may not be interested in dealing with this problem or not. It's, it's complicated to actually define which is the dominant trend in U.S. foreign policy right now because you have all this conflicting view. And there was even this idea that it was a Jacksonian way of, uh, of approaching foreign policy, a neo-isolationist foreign policy, which is impossible to talk about isolationism right now in the world. Yeah. It's absolutely impossible. But still, this kind of speech, very often it's, very often it's more about rhetoric than about anything else, sort of shaped the way in which it is presented. Of course, the twists are kind of crazy thing. But I do agree that there is this uh, group of, uh, I will say, discount neoconservatives that are in this position. I say discount because this is not like uh, there was uh, about 10, year, 10 years ago in which there were people that had a very coherent point of view, very coherent uh, set of policy proposals that came all the way back from the late 1970s, 1980s, when they talk about the rollback of revolution in Latin America, the Santa Fe documents, and all these active policies and preemptive attacks as a way to keep control of the world and trying to think about the world in which U.S. was still the only power in the world. So that's, that's why I say it's very difficult to say this is the line of U.S. in foreign policy. But yes, definitely there is this change. And what has changed the most is probably the environment surrounded all of this, including the decision-making process, including the environment for businesses in Cuba, 
for foreign companies. We know we, we have uh, information about some investment projects that were canceled, not from the states, from European companies coming from Europe or other parts of the world, because they say, okay, this is going back to before 2014. So this may be a risk, a huge risk. And it's also part of the thing. And even the idea of getting rid of the TTIP and the TPP, whatever you like it or not, there was a big project that was trying to uh, articulate the major, the biggest world markets into one huge free trade area with US as the pivotal point of all of this, the point of connection of the three areas, uh, which was pretty much Obama's strategy at the, uh, uh, Successful or not, we can discuss it, but it was his strategy. Good or not, we can discuss it, it was his strategy. And this administration dropped it right away as part of his getting rid of everything have to do with Obama's legacy. Without further, without actually replacing with a real strategy. And that's pretty much my point. As far as I can tell, I am not aware of any clear strategy in any of these levels. And Cuba, to my, in my opinion, is not different from that. The difference is that in all the, the thing is that in all of these different areas, there is some groups that do have agendas, and very often these groups are have been able to promote these agendas in these conditions, including these very radical people. To in that sense, that is clear that this change in the general environment is allowing this kind of political Cuba to flourish. But it's interesting what you point out, and I tried to mention that in, in the presentation, that despite all of that, the reversion is just partial. No total reversal, just partial, because there are interests and there are some structural changes that had already happened, which is, was not the case, let's say, 30 years ago. Okay. Um. Since uh, part of the reversal was aimed at the American citizens and uh, reversing their rights to travel, um, and uh, that the Cuba was dropped from the state sponsor of terrorism list, mm -hmm. do you think there's a legal basis for Americans to challenge travel restrictions and go to Cuba, challenge it in a court of law? <laughs> I'm not a lawyer myself. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that it is in the law, I mean, the travel restriction is in the law. They have to challenge that law. Now, is that constitutional, which would be the, uh, the challenge in, in front of the uh, Supreme Court or something? That's complicated, to, at, least, at least to me. I, I'm not sure that it's based for that. I'm not aware that there is a project or this idea of presenting, uh, taking the case to the Supreme Court with a really strong base to support it. There are some ideas, but nothing big. What they have been trying to do is to pass legislation lifting the, uh, that kind of restriction. I will say that there is no, no part of the Constitution that uh, explicitly allow, allows the government to restrict the citizens' right to travel anywhere. But there is no part of the Constitution that essentially uh, allows Congress to take foreign policy out of the hands of the president either. And they succeed in doing that. So we could even go as back as to uh, think about a case in front of the Supreme Court uh, arguing, arguing that this legislation that includes all these restrictions is essentially uh, anti-constitutional. It's against the Constitution. That could be a case, but that hasn't been tried either. So it, it is in that, that level, and I think that the problem is that is not American citizens. It's not the American citizens who is in the interest or the minds of the people that is making these decisions. Maybe corporations. And that, um, I think there is a lot of evidence that that's the case, not only in this particular area, but more broadly. What is happening right now, there is an increasing importance of corporation in, uh, in detriment of the individual citizens here in the States. So, there might be very good cases. Uh, definitely, and, and ethic, and, and from the point of view of the ethics and the rights of the citizens, is very clearly totally anti-constitutional or against the Constitution. 
that's what I can say. I, 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 I can go beyond that point. That is technical aspect that I just don't know. Yes? Just one quick question. Yes, of course. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. With the announcement that the Raul Castro will step down in 2018, mm -hmm. and the outcome of the, the election with the likely you know, successor of Diaz Canel, yes. in which way, you know, the fact that there won't be no Castros, you know, at least you know, in the in the role, will have some impact in the way you know the American foreign policy will see, you know, about the Cuba under Diaz Canel, if indeed he will be you nobody know, elected. Yeah, I uh, the point is that. Whereas, uh, despite the fact that the uh, no castering government yeah. is one of the requirements that is in the law, by the way, yeah, the for lifting the embargo slash blockade, let's put it this way. If Cuba tomorrow, with this government, even with Castro's in power, will accept U.S. leadership, will open the country to the control of anybody else, and probably open a couple of Trump hotels in Havana, uh, <laughs> something like that, if that will be the, the case, it will be more probable, more likely, that they will change all these policies than having no cuts in government, but, but keeping the same general uh, course of policies. Because, of course, it's not about democracy in Cuba. Some people is uh, uh, honestly in favor of what they understand as democracy for Cuba. Some other people is in fact, really, honestly, in favor of uh, giving freedom as a way they understood, they understand that to the Cuban people. But as a state policy, as a general interest from U.S. elites and U.S. government, it has to do with geopolitics, economic interests, not so much with democracy, ideology, whatever. As long as Cuba is not an influence in the region, for example, as long as Cuba is not a potential ally of a uh, so they give rival in the international system, and so on. That they will take that. Otherwise, and I have to compare. Otherwise, why is U.S. an ally with uh, Saudi Arabia, for example, which is the the great outlier for any speech around democracy in the world? <laughs> so that's the way in which I understand it. Maybe I'm too, I would say, cynical about it. But when you try to think about history, politics, power, and interest without trying to trying to keep passion and even ideologies out of the equation. That's what you end with. Yes? I want to talk about subversive programs okay. by the U.S. State Department against Cuba. Uh, and in the Obama towards the Trump administration, obviously we don't know what to expect from Trump. We can't find the 20 million. Since the Cuba Commission report, there's been a steady 20 million dedicated towards subversive acts in Cuba mm -hmm. to yes. democracy change. We can't find the 20 million because of Trump's new agenda towards internal versus external affairs. But we've had programs with you know the leadership of, just say, Trump, Clinton, De Laurentiis, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Moving downward, such as Suneo, World Learning, that attempt to manipulate. Mm -hmm penetrate HIV clinics, uh, manipulate pop culture figures. How has this influenced our current era of trust? How has this influenced our current era of trust, obviously? And what can we expect from a Trump, Tillerson, Goldberg collaboration, <laughs> production in the future? And what can we do as US citizens to be informed? Because I am very adamant about Regardless if you support or are against these programs, I am very adamant about informed consent. So how Absolutely. can we be informed and know what our government is doing mm -hmm. in terms of subversion? For sure. Uh, first of all, I think that trust is a currency that is very limited between Cuba and the United States. The level of trust that Cuba may have regarding the United States is so limited that it's almost non-existent at the government and many other levels. Because it is a, such, it's a long history that we have that, and, and in Cuba, we are more aware about history than you may be probably in the States. It's a, it's a cultural thing, it has nothing to do with, well, it has to have to do with politics, but it's also about culture and the way in which the education works and all that. So that's one thing. So to build trust 
will be probably the first and more important part of any process normalization to build trust between the two governments. Although there is no problem at all in Cuba, the belief with the American people. All of you have traveled to Cuba have most probably noticed that people in Cuba is has nothing against American people. And I do remember when I was in school, they will tell me all the time, and that was common, that yeah, there is the American government is doing this and that and that, but the American people is different, something else. People, American people is not responsible for this. So that is something that is embedded in the way in which we address the, this kind of issues. Uh, the thing is that without that trust, Everything that is done that is somehow targeting this uh, regime, trying to create regime change in Cuba, one way or the other, will generate an immediate reaction in Cuba. And let me tell you something. One of the most uh, significant, uh, I would say, news, or most important news we have had in the last few months, is how moderate the Cuban government has been has been answering these different policy changes in the states. Because I think it's very clear that US, uh, this administration and people involved in this administration is trying to force Cuba to break the relationship, the relationship on its own, which Cuba has never done, by the way. It was US who got the relationship in the first place. But anyway, it's part of this. And um, uh, appointing Goldberg is to Havana, with all his history in Bolivia, for example, is just another step in this process. I think that he will try to engage in uh, deals with the domestic opposition in Cuba. I do think he will do that, unless, unless say, we open a couple of strong hotels in Havana, uh, or any squad else in Cuba, uh, which I don't think will happen anytime soon. But I think that this is just another step in the way. What about what concerning what you can do as uh, American citizens? Well, to be informed, first of all, try to diversify your source of information. If you just get information from media, the dominant media here in the state, it doesn't matter that now they're fake news or not. <laughs> but they have been, I mean, that is editorial policy, that's true, which is the uh, private way to censor information. It is. We can name it whatever you want. There is no political censorship. Yes, there is not, but there is poli uh, editorial politics and policies, which essentially accomplish the same goals. So very often, this more nuanced and more and broader uh, perspectives on Cuba are not part of what is in media. So you need to go beyond that. You maybe you need to uh, uh, to compare American media uh, to Cuban media, which is available online. Not too good, not too not too diverse itself, but it's a difference from the American media. And there is also some resources online that could be used, even within the United States itself. Even within the Cuban American community, there are different points of view about it. And probably there is even a Cuban American left. <laughs> Small, very, very uh, unknown, with next to no influence at all, that there is. Cuban American left. Some academics, like Felix Masud, for example, is a, one of these guys hmm? yeah. in, the, in the poll. Yeah. And a few others, they have more balanced perspective. Cuba Lisandro Perez, for example, has his own more balanced perspective. And even a guy like Luper, who's much more a historian, but you can't use it to uh, understand or to study a little bit about Cuban history and Cuban legislation, the history of Cuban relations. It's available here. He's a professor in Chapel Hill. So there is a number of you can read my papers, of course. Um, <laughs> that is a self-promotion. That's part of it. <laughs> and then, no, but but really, it's, and and you can. There is some alternative media, uh, like Telesur, for example, that could be a source. Mm -hmm. So, I, my advice will be that to diversify as much as possible your sources of information. None of them will give you the whole the whole truth, but they will give you different views at the least, and you can then have your own, you make your own opinion, which I think is what, I, what is the most important. People make their own opinion. As you said, uh, it, try to make decisions and build your opinion based on facts, information, analysis, not just go with the only one I know, something like that, which is uh, really detrimental to what I was trying to build. And of course, 
after that, you can decide if you want to be part of a group or whatever, or just call the uh, congressperson of your district. That's a different thing. Wow. <laughs> well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I just wanna say thank you. Thank you so much for this great, illuminating talk today. And thank you for all of you for opening your minds to try to understand what's one of our most complex international relationships. So uh, great learning experience, great questions for us to think of. And I uh, um, just wanna give you a applause for great talk.